Mona Adil Herzalla. I'm an educator at uh, high schools in the UCF San Francisco Unified School District. And this I'm issue. I'm a proud member of the union, United Educators of San Francisco. Yeah. And this issue of closing schools, I mean, at the same time, they seem to have unlimited money for more wars, trillions of dollars. I mean, are they connected? I think this is quite ridiculous for the fact that we are denying our students, our parents, our communities, and our teachers the right uh, to for fair compensations and putting all these millions of dollars towards, you know, uh, wars, towards, uh, you know, supporting regimes that they are literally slaughtering kids and that we are standing here to, to get uh, uh, the right for our teachers to get what they, what they want, what they deserve. It's like we will stand up against uh, close, uh, closing uh, schools and denying uh, res essential resources for uh, schools. You know, it's, it's, it's can't, you can't even imagine the fact that, uh, as we heard today in the program, that some schools uh, suffer from not clean water. And that's, uh, I mean, you, 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 we say that the U.S. is the most powerful uh, government in the face of the earth and, the, and, and we don't have a clear water. That's ridiculous. In the same time, we take that resources and give it to regimes who are like uh, occupying uh, lands and military occupation like we are seeing in, in Palestine. And uh, we, we need to redirect all these resources towards where it, be, it belongs to the students, to the schools, and to the communities. And you have over 50 billionaires in San Francisco, and yet they say they can't have public education, community colleges under attack, UC students, you have to spend so much money to go to school with privatization. Is this part of the, what capitalists are doing in, in just public education? Well, we, this is what, why we're here. This is, uh, the actions like this is the fact that we're communities, uh, unions, uh, you know, students and teachers together and stand back against this. This is, you know, unfair. We need to have really a community and a society that stand with each other. And, and if, if the billionaires in, in San Francisco or elsewhere for that, fact, for that matter, to pay fair taxes as much as their income, this is, will be a much better situation. Well, that could be solved very quickly. Yeah. With 150 billion, yeah. <laughs> these people are yeah. massive wealth. Our schools will be in a much better situation. I think that our speaker spoke very well for all of us. It's about keeping the cuts as far away from the students and the folks who are working with the students as possible. Um, it's continuing to fight for what we all deserve. And what school are you at? I actually am one of the officers of the UESF. I'm one of the vice presidents. And the, San Francisco is a rich city. You have over 50 billionaires. What's going on that we can't really have great public schools in San Francisco? That is a great question, and I would love to hear that answer. <laughs> the state has taken over the schools, uh, Tony Thurman. I mean, you, where, where do you think that is? Because in Oakland, they are also threatening to close schools in Oakland. Do you think it's a systemic problem that, I mean, the, the schools are not being funded enough, so the result is they're trying to close, particularly schools in black working class neighborhoods like Malcolm X Academy? Well, first let's be clear that there is not a state takeover that has happened yet. Um, they're involved, but they have not taken over SFUSD. Um, I do believe that we're moving in the right direction to make sure that that does not happen here in San Francisco. And with us continuing to advocate, not just us here at UESF, but also uh, the greater community, the communities um, in uh, the southeast side of San Francisco, um, where schools like Malcolm X are at, um, with our families that are there and the community partners, I think that we will continue to keep these schools open. And FICMAT has been used to kind of coerce budget cuts. Do you think that agency should be investigated? Because it seems they, in uh, Inglewood they closed, they closed uh, public schools and kept the charters. Is that a concern of you that if they do try to close schools, they keep the charters open and money's continuing to go to the charters? I believe that the city is going to do what's best for all of its educators and for all of its children um, and families. And if things need to be investigated, then they'll be able to take care of those things. I'm Lisa Richardson from Malcolm X Academy. I am the family liaison at Malcolm X. I love my school. We are fighting for no school closures and no cuts. We need every dime to make that school operate at the fullest capacity. San Francisco Unified School District know that they can afford to keep 
all of our small schools open because their budget is not as high as some of the other ones. Small schools are important because it gives the kids a sense of community. The individual treatments. Absolutely, absolutely, individual treatment. We get to know our kids every day on a personal level because it is a small school and we get to see each and every one of their faces and know their names. And this is not the first time that Malcolm X has been threatened with closure. Why don't you talk about some of that history? Unfortunately, I wish um, our historian was here, but I've heard that this is the third time they've gone after Malcolm X. Each time we have fought to keep the school open, each time it's been successful, and we're going to continue to keep that school open by any means necessary, by any means necessary. And the KIPP uh, school next door, they sued the school district to take over rooms. What's going on with, with that? Unfortunately, I can't speak about that because when I came on board, Kip had just left. So I don't... So they're no longer there? No, they're gone. They're gone. Yes, they've moved on, you know, but um, yeah, so I can't speak on How Kip. How does it feel being in a city with all this wealth, 50, over 50 billionaires? There's so much wealth in San Francisco, yet they're saying to kids, particularly black, poor working class kids, you're not going to get a great education. And private schools are growing. There's still charter schools. Mm -hmm. It feels like we've been underrepresented just like this all of our lives. We have been put in the past, looked uh, past, and I feel like now it's time for us to stand up and fight for our rights. We're not going back. And I know the kids at Malcolm X want to make it a great school, the teachers. And actually, the smaller schools are better for education, aren't they? I feel that way. I feel like this. If you have less than 120 kids, you get to know every one of their names because a person can remember at least 120 names. So each one of our kids know us by name, and we know them by name. And that's better. And they also talk here about health problems, having social workers, having you know, people to really help the, the kids, particularly those that are under stress and pressure. Absolutely. After COVID, so many of our families have experienced trauma, real trauma, loss of jobs, you know, loss of income, homelessness, you know, not able to feed their uh, students with a small community school. We have a food bank. We have, you know, we're able to feed some of our families. We have folks donating. I was taking food to families during the pandemic, helping them out. It is not as easy for some of our families because we don't have the adequate um, things that we need in that neighborhood because we're left behind. So you're going to fight to keep the school open? Absolutely. By what? any means necessary, Malcolm X says, by any means necessary. By any means necessary, we pledge to stay open. My name is Nick. And you're here today at a rally for the teachers at uh, SFUSD. What, what are the issues that concern you about what's happening with education and the schools in San Francisco? As a San Francisco educator and as an educator in general, one of the issues that most disturbs me is the constant, constant tendency to try to balance the budget on the backs of students instead of where things could be cut, like higher up in the administration or maybe on looking at the number of consultants that are hired. And the privatization, is that a concern of you? It, for me individually, and I would say collectively as a system, it absolutely is an enormous concern because one of the biggest issues that happens is there's always the tendency to say, oh, let's, let's save money, let's save money. And it's always wanting to privatize, always wanting to put things there, oh, let's get contractors in, let's do this. And it's cheaper in the short run, but not really. And then in the long run, it costs so much more when you have privatization because a private a privatization leads to profit motive which leads to exploitation the commodification of schools absolutely and our charters are concerned with you yeah, I do have to say that charter schools are a concern of mine because I feel that largely the charter school miracle is kind of failed. I feel like the whole point of charters, what they were supposed to do was they're supposed to show us new ways that we could then revitalize the public school system. We're supposed to bring those traditions back in. But unfortunately, largely what charters seem to do is they instead just replicate a public school system on a smaller scale. And therefore, it's much more inefficient because you have to have a head and you have to have people to promote the charter and you have to have their particular angle. So I feel the charter school system is not necessarily good. And the billionaires, of course, are giving money to charters to, to make money on charters. Oh, that's one of the biggest things. Whenever I talk to people about it, I'm like, can I 
Can I say piracy? I don't know. I'm like, I don't support Netflix because Reed, Reed Hastings supports charter schools, for example. Yeah, like uh, good old good old, good old old Jeff Bezos. You know, he's one of, billionaires very much love to dump money in the charter system. Billionaires very much love to support their charter system because billionaires don't like public education because it's a, it's a, it's a loss leader. It's a money loser. But also because in public schools, you can work to teach children things like, hey, you're a worker. The rights of workers are very important. You can join a union. That's a very important thing for you. Labor rights are very essential for you as a child because you know what? You're way more likely to be a worker than a billionaire. If you're going to be a worker, join a union. And you have a hat, class war, veteran. What does that mean? Well, at my old site, before I left, I used to be the union rep, and my uh, my old compatriots there got it for me when I was leaving. Like, oh, you guys know it all too well. Uh, for me, I wear it because the idea that we're in an undeclared class war right now. The rich have declared war on us, on the workers and the poor. And so as a it Seems like there's a lot of money for war right now. There is a lot of money for war right now and not a lot of money for other peaceful endeavors. But as a veteran of the constant day-to-day -day struggle, that's my idea is no war but class war should be waged because we don't need to wage war on people around the world when the rich are profiting from that very war itself. And the genocide that's going on in Gaza, the destruction of schools, the bombing of schools. I mean, how does it feel to be an educator and watch that go on? One of the things to talk about is, yeah, hearing hearing what's coming out from there, hearing about the destruction of schools, getting appeals from labor in Palestine, people who are saying, like, hey, fellow laborers around the world, can you stand with us in solidarity and work together? Because it undercuts the notion that we're all people, we're all human beings, and to see human beings dehum being dehumanized by others is a really terrible thing to have to sit and teach that to kids and pretend that this is normal. And it seems like there's an unlimited budget, trillion, billions, trillions, I mean, it's just more and more money, and yet here in San Francisco, other communities, schools are facing cutbacks. Well, the military-industrial complex, as we talked about, especially with privatization of everything, not just the school system, but the United States government itself. I mean, as we're seeing the constant race to profit, 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 and we're very much seeing that, where, yeah, the military-industrial complex does stand to profit greatly from war because that's what it's set up to do, whereas it doesn't stand to pro profit as greatly from the peace dividend that could be borne by teaching people about peaceful solutions to problems. And the politicians are voting for more money for war, Yet, I mean, it wasn't brought up at this rally, the whole issue of the war. You think that the labor movement has to bring that up in its contract issues? Or, I mean, there are a lot of, like at UC, 100,000 workers are having negotiating with the UC regions, but around economic issues, but aren't they connected with the fact that all the, a lot of money is going for war? I mean, all the issues are intrinsically connected to each to each other, but yeah, I very much feel, again, not speaking as a representative of my union, but only as an individual, but yes, I absolutely think that there are, that is an important thing to talk about, the issue of war. I mean, we were seeing at the various universities, the students who were attempting to strike out, who were trying to push back against any investments that the university system may have had within any kind of things like that, because the economy is so intertwined, I think something basic like that, like, hey, we looked at it back in the 80s, we were really looking at, let's pick apart, let's pull out apartheid, let's pull out the support that's invested in South Africa. We should very much be looking at, hey, let's divest of this component that's invested in Raytheon. Let's divest of this component that's invested in this corporation that builds weaponry or this corporation that profits from climate destruction. Let's work to pull those back. And yeah, you don't get as good profit from them because because the system is set up for profit in those ways. But the people, the common people, the laborers, the workers, we can say, listen, we can take less now and build a better future later. We can be building towards a future together where we don't have to be slaves. We don't have to be chewed up by the machine and spit out so that they can profit. So absolutely, I think war is an important issue we need to be talking about in labor contracts on where is the money going? One of the most significant issues, and the first I would like to point out that I unfortunately made this on a post box, which is not printed union. I would have made it on a General Mills box, but I'm not done emptying the, the Rice Krispies yet. Uh, they are union made, so I like to buy those. My sign says, Madam Mayor, uh, release your secret closure list because one of the significant issues that happened was one of the reasons why it was the nail in the coffin why the superintendent was squeezed out was because he released the list of schools that were to be closed before the election but it was communicated that he and the mayor the mayor was unhappy because he released a list that was different than the list that she had already been told 
So I would like to know what schools are on that list? What schools were on the mayor's list? Because Sunshine being the best disinfectant, I'd just like to know what schools were on the list that she received. Because that seems as if we shouldn't be keeping anything secret from the people. Like schools you're gonna close. The way the superintendent phrased it to parents. Because as a school employee, the superintendent sends emails and we receive them and the parents receive the same emails but when the superintendent says something to parents many times parents are like oh whatever the school district says of course but it's not of course there's an entire process for how school closures are going to happen and that wasn't well outlined in that email that he sent out to parents and he bungled the list and they sent out the wrong list and then they had to amend that later and then they sent out an email that was meant for one school to the entire school district and it was cavalcade after cavalcade of just he tripped over his feet repeatedly there and the fact that the list was released before the election yeah and there were protests at schools in, yep. in Chinatown and others you think that had an effect that they were concerned that people would say we're not going to support you politically as you know she supported the by billionaires oh yeah, oh, yeah. you've got all these billionaires in San Francisco spending millions and millions of dollars for their candidates to uh, basically further privatization oh I didn't even talk about my thoughts in the mayoral race yet yes I absolutely think that that's one that that is one of the reasons why the wedge was driven because originally this list was supposed to come out earlier. This list was supposed to come out in the summer, and then it was supposed to come out in August, and then it was supposed to come out in September. Like, the list was supposed to come out. So I don't know what kind of dealings happened. I don't know what happened to lead the list keep getting kicked further and further down, but then released at such an inopportune time, and then for this to happen. So yes, I definitely think there's some there's some behind-the-scenes shenanigans that occurred. Yeah, because she's supported by... she. She loves to talk about her bona fides of how she's always been a renter and all these things. She loves to talk about, loves to talk herself up. But yeah, as you say, she's accepting millions of dollars, millions of dollars in her hand to fundraise for these billionaires. Billion, billionaires are flooding the money. I mean, for for Farrell, for Lurie, for Breed, they're taking so much cash in for this election. And yeah, it's one of the things like most of the people, most of the, the most of the major names, like three of the five major names are running to the right in this mayoral election. And then there's two people who are running vague center, vaguely center left. And one of the biggest issues is, yeah, there's a lot of cash that's getting kicked around here. So I absolutely think that what happened with the superintendent, I absolutely think that one of the reasons why the mayor was so willing to withdraw her support so quickly was because somebody bungled and the wrong the list got the list that they finally couldn't hold it off any longer had to get put out and then it turned out oh this was the wrong list you should have held it until after the election and we're facing an election in a few days there's the danger of fascism there's a fascist movement growing in this country how are unions confronting that? Because, as you know, most unions are giving millions of dollars to Harris. They're saying that Harris and the Democrats will solve the problem. If Trump becomes president, are unions, are working people prepared in this country? I mean, Harris and the Democrats aren't really going to solve the problem either, unless the Democratic Party needs to remember what it was like when it was the party of Roosevelt. The Democratic Party needs to remember, like, oh, we can support working people because when you support material improvements for people, people will vote for you. When you support material improvements for people's lives, even more importantly, their lives get better. So the Democratic Party needs to remember that it's not owed fealty by anyone. It's, it doesn't deserve people's votes just because it's the Democratic Party. And yeah, it's interesting to see as we're coming out, getting closer to the election, to see that, oh, well, we're going to vote for Trump, we're going to vote for this. But no, Harris isn't going to fix the system intrinsically because the system is incumbent within capitalism. It's not really ensconced within any particular person. We're seeing rising fascism we've seen rising fascist tendencies for years because as we've been underfunding public education and critical thinking skills for the past 50 years it's led to that and the decline in material improvements slow chipping away at the improvements of the new deal that have allowed the historic gains of the working class to be suppressed and suppressed various things that happened in the 80s in the 90s like the the elimination of various provisions that allowed um, that allowed inve the investment banks to also then get into the housing market. Basically, everything that has changed, everything that's gone to chip away at the gains that were made during the New Deal that were meant to prevent the Great Depression, we're seeing the replication of similar conditions, and people are, people are really upset. So what we need to do is we absolutely need to be worried about hey, let's be proffering solidarity, like direct action to our fellow workers. Let's offer direct action, but also if 
if the worst case scenario happens and civil war were to then break out, well, then people need to be ready to do whatever they can do and whatever method they're going to be able to uphold their, their community and defend them, defend themselves and their neighbors from oppressive forces. The students united will now.